Although we didn't get to watch the Orioles play, it was a fun wild card weekend of baseball that included a hilarious collapse by the Toronto Blue Jays. But today, we are back to the Baltimore Orioles. I'm answering your O's questions coming up on a Mailbag Monday episode of the podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Monday, October 10th, 2022, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, I'm going to be answering your Orioles questions. It's a mailbag Monday edition of the Locked On Orioles podcast. I've got nine questions, all from you, the listeners here that I'm going to answer here in about 30 minutes of today's pod. And really wanted to answer some questions just to set the tone for this offseason, because coming up soon, we will get into our favorite moments from the 2022 season. We'll start reviewing player by player how they did, give out some grades for their season, look ahead to what these guys will do and how they'll fit into this team going into 2023. Of course, here on the podcast, we'll have plenty of content previewing the offseason, what the O's will do in trades, in free agency, with the Rule 5 draft and everything in between. As Mike Elias has said, it will be lift off this offseason season. But I got to answer your questions first. And of course, we thank you for sending in your questions. We thank you for making Locked on Orioles your first podcast listen of the day. We continue daily episodes here Monday through Friday here on the pod. We'll have brand new episodes of the Locked on Orioles podcast. Of course, wherever you get your pods, you can get this pod. Also, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the Locked on Orioles YouTube channel to get all the content here this offseason. We're still five days a week until November. Then we'll go to three days a week for the rest of the offseason. But we thank you so much for staying tuned. And we thank you for making Locked On Orioles your first listen of the day. For your first listen today, it's a Mailbag Monday. Nine questions I'm getting to all from you, the listener. Remember, if you want to submit a mailbag question for a future mailbag episode, you can tweet to us at Locked On Orioles or tweet me at Connor Newcomb underscore. The DMs are also open for both of those accounts if you'd like to send a question. You can also email us at LockedOnOrioles at gmail.com. You can send a question in the YouTube comments on our YouTube page on any of the videos. Or if you leave a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts, you can leave a question in the review section as well. All of those ways will get your question answered here on the podcast, but let's jump right into it. Hitting a lot of different topics here on today's Mailbag Monday. All these questions coming from users via Twitter. And we're going to start off with a question from Ben Appel from Twitter, who asks, what position besides starting pitcher will the Orioles most likely look to upgrade this offseason? And, you know, the caveat with starting pitcher, I think that's probably the most likely position is starting pitcher. So if we go beyond that, for Ben's question, he kind of put a caveat in his question as well about, you know, the Orioles having some good middle infield prospects ready to come up, which they do Jordan Westberg. And then behind him, Joey Ortiz and Connor Norby in triple a, but I still think the answer is the infield, maybe not specifically middle infield. Cause it could be a third baseman as well, but I think it is infielders. There are free agents available. And I would really only say, I mean, Ryan Mountcastle is locked into first base, but I would really only say that Gunnar Henderson is the only other guy locked into an infield position for opening day. Now, whether that's going to be a shortstop or third base or a combination of the two, that remains to be seen. But I think Henderson is the only one locked in. I think Jorge Mateo probably locked into a roster spot, but not necessarily a starter. And then you'd have to think Rugnet Odor is gone. Taryn Vavra, it could go either way. Ramon Arias, it could go either way. So there are some options and some openings for the Orioles. And yes, Joey Ortiz and Jordan Westberg could be great players in the big leagues. They also could take some time to get there. They also could be traded for major league help for the Orioles. So I think looking at a really top heavy infield free agent class is where the O's are going to go this off season. And even if they can't get one of the big dogs, I think they're going to at least going to bring in kind of a middle tier infielder. We'll talk about that later in this episode, but I definitely think that's going to be priority one behind starting pitching for the Orioles. Our second question comes via Twitter from at ball underscore O's underscore funk, who asks which first base slash DH type free agents could the Orioles target? And this is a good question because 
obviously the O's had two of these guys on the roster this year in Ryan Mountcastle and Trey Mancini. Then they traded Trey Mancini to the Astros at the deadline and found themselves in a spot where they really didn't have as much production to replace Trey as they wanted in that spot. They thought, you know, either Kyle Stowers would come up and replace that, or maybe Tyler Nevin would take a step forward. And Stowers did some of his part, but it still wasn't great. And the Orioles ended up signing Jesus Aguilar to kind of just fill that bench role as a first base DH for the final month of the season. And we know he did not hit well at all. So the O's are going to need to upgrade there. And now I will say Jesus Aguilar will be a free agent again. He's always an option if the O's think they can kind of get his swing back to what it was a couple years ago. But there's certainly better options out there. And I think the number one option has to be Josh Bell right now for the Orioles. Of course, you've been watching him this weekend with the San Diego Padres. Now, Bell's had a really interesting year because overall he has a 123 WRC+. plus. He's been great. The average has been there. The power, 17 home runs. Hasn't been quite what you'd expect from Josh Bell, but still a good season. The issue is the difference between his time with the Nationals before the trade deadline and then his time with the Padres after the trade deadline. He was dominant with the Nats. He had just a 79 WRC plus down the stretch with San Diego. He was 21% worse than a league average hitter down the stretch. He's 30 years old. Does this mean Bell is starting to regress a little bit? I'm not sure. He is a switch hitter. And because of the bad end of the season, his cost is probably down from what it would have been, you know, just a couple of months ago. I'm sure that will help the Orioles if they do go after him. It'd be nice to get another switch hitter in the lineup, a guy who has power to all fields, whether he's hitting righty or lefty, a guy who can still play first base defensively as well. If you need him, he'd be mostly a DH. I think I would go after a guy like that. I mean, if they couldn't get a Josh Bell, the big name in this group is Jose Abreu, who won the MVP with the White Sox in 2020, had another great year this year. He's 36. I think he's probably going to be out of the Orioles price range for that position just because they have Mount Castle too. Obviously, Trey Mancini is going to be a free agent. I'd love to see that reunion. I feel like maybe Mike Elias might have burned that bridge by trading him. And then, as I mentioned, there's guys like Jesus Aguilar and a guy like Brandon Belt will be out there. You know, the veteran who's been with the Giants his whole career. He'll be 35 in April. He's definitely starting to decline a little bit. He had a 96 WRC plus this year. He's dealt with injuries for really like the past five seasons. It's basically been a league average hitter. So I don't know how much the O's really want him, but he's a left-handed hitter, which will play better at Camden Yards. He still plays a, a good first base defensively as well and be a really good leader, I think, in the Orioles clubhouse. But those are definitely some of those first base DH names that they could go after. Next question comes from Bertle via Twitter, who asks, who are good starting pitchers the O's could go after via trade? This offseason, this is a distinctive question, because I think the O's will be in the starting pitching free agent market this offseason. Now, I don't think it'll be the Jacob deGrom type guys, but maybe a Carlos Rodon or maybe guys below that. But I also think the Orioles are well positioned to trade for a top line starting pitcher because of the depth they have in their farm system, all the talent at the higher levels, double and triple A, and the fact that they have talent behind that. They got the best system in baseball right now. So I think the name we've gone over time and time again, a name I talked about a lot at the trade deadline, a guy who ended up not being dealt is Pablo Lopez, the right-hander for the Marlins. Had a 3.75 ERA this year. He was apparently very close to being dealt to the Yankees at the deadline before that deal fell through. He still has two more years left on his contract. So the O's would have him for 2023 and 24. Still young, has some really good stuff. Great split changeup. I would go after Pablo Lopez. The Marlins desperately need hitting prospects. They have plenty of pitching. I think they're willing to trade from their pitching depth to get hitters. The O's have plenty of hitting prospect depth. It makes them seem like perfect trade partners for Pablo Lopez, although we've talked about that a lot, and that kind of trade still hasn't happened. We'll see if it happens this time. I think he's the top choice. Beyond that, if the O's really want to dig deep, they could maybe go after Shane Bieber, now, I know that sounds crazy because the Cleveland Guardians and Shane Bieber just swept the Rays and have advanced to the ALDS and just won the AL Central. And I think a lot of people would pick them to win that division again next year, but they don't really spend money. The White Sox and Twins spend a lot more money and are going to be gunning for that division title next year. And the Guardians have shown time and time again, they are willing to trade guys when they get to arbitration and are close to becoming free agents. They traded Francisco Lindor. They almost traded Jose Ramirez this offseason before at the last minute signing him to an extension. And obviously he's been by far their best player leading them to a division title. But if they do want to cut more payroll, 
Shane Bieber, who has two more years, is going into arbitration. The O's would have him 23 and 24. Now he's had a great year, a 2.88 ERA. Despite his velocity going down, he's continued to be maybe even a better pitcher. He's an ace. You go get Shane Bieber. He is the ace of your staff. He's starting opening day next year if the O's go and get him. And it would take some big names like Jordan Westbergs or Kyle Stowers or Joey Ortiz. But I'd go do it. To get Shane Bieber for two years, then you try to extend him, go right ahead. And then the other name, which would be a much lower on the cost, is a guy like Adrian Hauser, the right-hander, who was in the Brewers rotation most of the year till he kind of faltered at the end, as did the Milwaukee Brewers at the end. Now, Hauser had a 4.75 ERA this year, but he had a 3.22 ERA in 2021. He had a fantastic year last year, just really a down year, dealt with a couple injuries this season. He's not crazy dominant, not a huge, you know, strike you out guy, but he can pitch deeper into games. He's got some interesting stuff. He's not a free agent till after 2024. I think he could be a buy low candidate for an Orioles team that would like to add a mid rotation starter and a Brewers team that, again, is probably going to look to cut a little payroll this year as Hauser's going to get more expensive into next year. Maybe that's a more realistic guy that the O's could go after. But we've got six more questions to answer coming up here on this Mailbag Monday episode as the Orioles trying to, you know, not just do what they did this year in 2023, but take it to the next level next year. And for some of you, I know that you want to trade a lot of these prospects, as we just talked about, go after maybe some of these top line starting pitchers as well. And I know for some of you, you kind of want to protect these prospects. You know, you, you want to keep these Westbergs, the Ortiz, the Kowser, and instead maybe just spend the money on the free agents and, and protect these guys and, and go with what we've got. But speaking of protection, the numbers don't lie. In the last decade, over 4 million people have chosen Simply Safe Home Security to protect their home. You don't earn the trust of that many people without doing something right. At Simply Safe, your safety is the only thing that matters. And, you know, they protect you with cutting edge security technology powered by 24 7 professional monitoring agents who always have your back. And here's why it is such a great product. With those 24 7 professional monitoring, Simply Safe's agents call you the moment a threat is detected and dispatch police or first responders in an emergency, even if you're not home or even if you can't be reached. And Simply Safe blankets your home in protection with advanced sensors for every single room, window, and door. They've got HD security cameras for inside and outside your home. Just got smarter ways to detect motion that only alert you when a threat is real. And you can customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com slash locked on MLB. And you save 20% on your Simply Safe security system when you sign up for an interactive monitoring plan and get your first month free. Again, that is simplysafe.com slash locked on MLB to learn more. There's no safe like Simply Safe. So we're back here on a Mailbag Monday episode of the podcast, answering your Orioles questions. And we'll jump right back into it with our fourth question of the day. This one comes from at Jala underscore 78 on Twitter, who asks straight to the point here. I enjoyed this question a lot. What number will Carlos Correa wear in Baltimore next year? Well, Jay, when the Orioles sign him to a four year, $100 million deal to come play in Baltimore, I think he'll wear number one. He wore number four in Minnesota this year, but of course, Earl Weaver's number four is retired. So I see him going back to the number one that he wore in Houston, taking Richie Martin's jersey number, who just elected free agency over the weekend. Give me Correa in that number one uniform. Question number five, which comes from at We Are Birdland on Twitter, asking who would be the Orioles quote player emeritus? And he kind of describes that theoretical position as a spot on a roster that is preserved for a veteran leader who, you know, only maybe plays once a week, whether it's pitching an inning or pinch hitting or whatever it may be. And for me, you know, even if you asked, Hey, you can scour all the free agents to add this position, especially if it became like a specialized 27th position, we just got to bring in a guy who was kind of a player coach leader who played a little bit. If the O's got that chance going into next year, I'd bring back Rugnet Odor. 
I mean, if you could pinch hit him once or twice a week, you know, in the ninth inning against a tough righty when he was great this year, Rugnet Odor was amazing in high leverage scenarios. He was incredible. He was pretty bad anytime else, but he was really good in high leverage scenarios. He seemed to be so important to that Orioles clubhouse and their turnaround they made this season. If that role existed, I would 100% bring Rugnet Odor back in that spot. Next question comes from Jordan Kendall on Twitter, who asked for both my realistic and my optimistic expectation for the Orioles in the 2023 season. Now, it's a little tough to answer this question fully right now because we haven't even gotten into the offseason. We really kind of have no idea what the Orioles roster will look like next year. If it mostly looks like this, you know, they add on the edges, they promote some prospects, it's a different answer than the Orioles go out and get Trey Turner and Carlos Rodon and they just add to this roster big time. Those are two different answers. But let's assume maybe they're somewhere in the middle of those two off seasons. I would say the realistic expectation is they compete like they did this year for a playoff spot, just without the detrimental April and September. Remember, the O's had very bad losing records in both of those months. They had a 7 and 14 April. You get off to a better start. Then, you know, you're around the 85 to 90 win mark in September. You're competing for a playoff spot, and hopefully they get one of those wild card spots. I know it's going to be tough because the AL East is good but you only have to play AL East teams 13 times instead of 19 times. That'll help the Orioles. I think realistic expectations is 85, 86 plus wins up to somewhere around 90. And even if you don't make the playoffs next year, you're considered a playoff contender all year. Cause the O's really weren't considered a playoff contender until late June, early July, really when they rattled off the 10 game winning streak, they got over 500. And then you're kind of starting to talk about them. Realistic expectation is from opening day, you're considered a playoff contender. You play on pace for 85 to 90 wins all year, and you stay in that conversation whether you make it or not. Now, the most optimistic expectation, the O's add, they get really good. That's a 90-plus win season where you're competing a little bit for the AL East title. You're not winning the AL East. I think that's way too much to ask. I mean, the Yankees are very good, even if they don't bring back Aaron Judge. The Blue Jays, despite... What happened to them this weekend, which I'm still laughing about. They're going to be very good. The Rays are going to be the Rays, and the Red Sox are going to be at least competitive. But I think optimistic expectations, 90-plus wins, a team that you can at least feel like you could pencil into a wild card spot next year, and we're playing playoff baseball. We're watching playoff baseball this time next season. I mean, that's, that's optimistic. I know that's optimistic, but – Man, would I love that. And I think if the O's did go and get a Trey Turner or they got a Carlos Correa and they got a a Carlos Rodon or a Chris Bassett, whoever it may be, some of these big names to help the rotation and to help a lineup, which was really more disappointing than anything on this team. It was the one place where the Orioles really didn't improve that much from 2021, as we talked about last week on the podcast. I think they could be in that conversation. I don't even think there's an optimistic enough take where I say the Orioles are going to be AL East champs next year but they could at least be a playoff team that is awesome to watch. We get to watch some postseason baseball. I've been watching a lot of postseason baseball this weekend for wildcard weekend. I know it's stressful when your team's in it. Trust me. I remember from 2012 and 2014, 2016, but I want that feeling back. And I think that could certainly happen going into next year. We got three more questions here on the mailbag Monday episode to answer. We'll talk a little bit about, some free agent targets for the Orioles, potentially as pitchers, as infielders, and relief pitchers as well. That's coming up next. So we're finishing up a Mailbag Monday episode of the podcast here as the Orioles, unfortunately, not playing any postseason baseball this weekend, Wild Card weekend. Actually, the first Monday episode since April where I did not have a weekend of games to recap. It was, uh, it was a little sad starting to record the podcast, realizing that I'm not giving you my three big takeaways from the weekend. Instead, I'm, I'm answering your questions, which I love to do. I love to preview this off season. It, it's lift off as Michael Elias said, but I still wish there was Orioles baseball on, but we'll still get to your questions here. Three questions left here on a mailbag Monday episode. And this one comes from Tom's Mohawk via Twitter. As he asks, Will free agent pitchers consider Baltimore this offseason? And this is something a lot of people have talked about because 
in the old stadium dimensions, a lot of the kind of rhetoric around the Orioles and free agency was that even if they had the money to pay these free agent starting pitchers, they wouldn't want to come to Baltimore because it was such an extreme hitters park with you know, the short porch and left and right, all the home runs that are hit in the ballpark that pitchers just didn't want to come here. And, and that, that was some of the issue with, you know, the biggest pitching contract given out being Ubaldo Jimenez and that obviously not working out very well, but I do think pitchers are going to want to come here. And, and one thing there is the change to the ballpark with Baltimore out there now, you know, going 30 feet up, going 10 feet back. It definitely makes a difference. It turned Oriole Park from a hitter's into a pitcher's park. And it's really hard for right-handed hitters to hit the ball out now. That helps pitchers. But I don't think that's the number one thing that's going to bring pitchers here. I think a bigger chunk than the wall is that this Orioles team showed this year that they're ready to compete. To go from 52 to 83 wins, if you're a veteran solid, you know, two or three in the rotation starting pitcher, and you want to go compete and pitch in playoff games, Baltimore is now an option. It has not been an option since 2017. It is now an option to do that again. And the other thing is, if the O's are going to pay these guys what they're worth, they're going to come play for this team. Now it's harder to convince a guy, even if you're paying him 25 to $30 million a year to come play for a team that just lost 110 games. But when you just won 83 games and you say, Hey, we're right there. We just need you and a couple other guys to really get us to the postseason. Then you're offering 25 million. You add that and the ballpark. I think that can get pretty much anybody to come play for Baltimore. Simple as that. Pay them the money they want and the winning helps and the wall helps. I think we're going to get some starting pitchers coming in on free agent deals and not the Ubaldo Jimenez types. Next question comes from Milo on Twitter, who asks, who are the free agent infielders the Orioles could target besides Carlos Correa this offseason? This is a good question because I think Carlos Correa, not, not only by me, but by a lot of people in the Orioles media verse, Orioles Twitter verse, the go-to response for let's add an infield bat to really sure up this lineup is Carlos Correa. And I think there's a lot of reason to that. Number one reason is there was those little connections between the Orioles and Correa last offseason when he was a free agent. And obviously he ends up signing with the Minnesota Twins, but there were some reports that we all saw. And there's some connections there with Elias in Houston and Correa in Houston. And he also makes sense for the Orioles. And the fact that he signed with the Twins makes you think, well, maybe he'd be open to signing with a team like the Orioles too. And now Correa has not officially opted out yet. And we don't know exactly what he's going to do. But with how disappointing the Twins ended up being this season, I think a lot of people in the media are in agreement that Carlos Correa will opt out of this deal. He signed a three-year deal with Minnesota, but it had a player opt out after each season. So he can opt out this year. And I think he will. And so that'll make him a free agent. And he's certainly going to be on the Orioles radar. But to answer Milo's question, there are other options, either if Correa doesn't opt out or if he just doesn't sign with the Orioles. I think the big two are Trey Turner and Xander Bogarts. Now, Trey Turner, of course, had the great career with the Nationals, was traded to the Dodgers last year. He's going to be a free agent. He's very, very good. A 128 WRC plus this year. Good defender at shortstop. Elite, elite speed. It would be fun to have Trey Turner at the top of the Orioles lineup. And you have two legitimate leadoff options in Turner and Cedric Mullins. I think Trey Turner would actually hit leadoff in that spot. You probably move Mullins down to you know sixth in the lineup or something. That would be awesome to get. Now, he's going to be looking for his first big long-term deal. This will be his first time hitting free agency. So he's going to want those six, seven, eight years, you know, with 25-ish million dollars per year. If the O's want to give that out, I think Trey Turner is a great bet to bring in. And the other guy who we don't know if he's going to be a free agent is Xander Bogarts. Similar to Carlos Correa, Bogarts has an opt-out that he can become a free agent this year. Now, most people have kind of just assumed that Correa – is going to opt out. I think a lot of people are kind of 50-50 on Xander Bogarts, whether or not he's going to stay with Boston or opt out of his deal. Now, it doesn't help that Boston had such a disappointing 2022 for in terms of him staying with the Red Sox. If he does opt out, go get him. 134 WRC+. plus. He's not a gold glove defender at short, but he can pick it over there and he can play shortstop. Even if you have to move him to third down the line, that's fine by me with how incredible the bat is. I know it hurts a little bit because he's not a crazy power righty 
And, you know, some of it, his home runs are going to go away, moving from Fenway Park to, you know, the new dimensions at Oriole Park. But he's still a great hitter, uses the whole field, has great opposite field power, which helps to bring in a righty to this ballpark. I would just love to have Xander Bogarts on this team. He is a very good baseball player. I've seen him beat the Orioles too many times over the past almost decade at this point. Give me Xander Bogarts. Dansby Swanson presumably is also going to be out there. The Brave shortstop is due to be a free agent. They've seemingly given every other player on their team a contract extension except for Dansby Swanson. It makes me think like that means the plan is for them to not re-sign Swanson and to kind of go with the infield of Austin Riley, Vaughn Grisham, and Ozzie Albies, and Matt Olson moving forward. So to me, it looks like Swanson's going to become a free agent. Now he's having his best year, a 116 WRC+, plus, been big in the Atlanta lineup this year. And he was looking like a little bit of a disappointment kind of, People thought he might have been a bust as the number one pick for a while, but he's really broken out over the past couple of years. He's going to be a guy looking for, you know, that five-year, $110, $120 million contract, I think, as he approaches 30 here. Good defender, good bat. I'd take him on the O's. 100% would go after Dansby Swanson. But if you want to go down to, like, the next tier, if you don't think the O's are going to go after the big name or you don't think they should, because whether it's Gunnar Henderson, Jordan Westberg, Joey Ortiz, you just want to kind of add more on the margins in the infield. They got to add somebody. Adam Frazier is going to be out there. You know, you've seen him with the Mariners this weekend. As I laugh again, because of what they did to the Blue Jays. Frazier, though, the bat, just an 81 WRC plus. He's really got no power, just a singles hitter. I'm not in love with Adam Frazier. I'd rather not, but he's a guy who's starting on a playoff team right now. So there's that. Jace Peterson is out there, former Orioles legend. Remember him from, from the 2018 and 2019 O's. He's actually been solid with the Brewers as kind of a utility guy. He's not an everyday starter, but he does play a lot. A 96 WRC plus, which means pretty much a league average hitter. And he's a plus defender at every position. He can play second. He can play short, third. He can play left field, right field. He can play a little first base if you need him to. So he's very versatile. I think he really helps a playoff team to have off the bench. So I would not mind at all having Jace Peterson. I even think he's an upgrade over a guy like Ramon Arias, for example. But I wouldn't like Peterson to be like the only name that they had. And then one other guy I want to just throw in here is Matt Carpenter. Now, it looked like Matt Carpenter was done. His baseball career was done. At the end of his time with the Cardinals, he couldn't hit at all. He was hitting like 120. It was, it was tough to watch. Then he revamps his swing this offseason. He signs a minor league deal with the Texas Rangers, which had an opt-out after one month. Texas did not call him up, so he opted out of the deal. And then he signed a major league deal with the New York Yankees because they saw what the Rangers didn't, that that revamp swing was working. Then Matt Carpenter joins the Yankees lineup and was the hottest hitter in baseball, when he was with the Yankees before he got injured, he had a 217 WRC plus in 154 plate appearances with the Yankees. He was just mashing home run after home run from the left side of the plate. The short porch was helping him a little bit, but his batted ball data looked good. The swing looked changed. He looked like a new hitter. Now, we don't know how sustainable it is because, again, after 154 plate appearances, he got injured and we haven't seen him since. But if he's looking for like a one year, you know, five, six, seven, eight million dollar deal, if I'm the Orioles, I do that 100% of the time. He can still play first and second base and third base if you need. He's a left handed hitter with power, which still plays very well at Camden Yards. And you don't have to commit to him being an everyday starter. You can kind of just DH or, you know, play just against righties, be a, a big bat off the bench. I'd do it. I'd go after Matt Carpenter. And, you know, it wouldn't cost that much. And if the swing change isn't a long term fix, you can DFA him, and it's not a huge deal, but, but that's another guy I'd go after. Then our final question of the day on this Mailbag Monday episode comes from at ZFarm underscore on Twitter, who asks, who would the Orioles add if they went after a relief pitcher this offseason? This is actually something I've talked about a little bit during the year. It's going to be interesting to see what the O's do with the bullpen, because you would think, okay, they're going into next year thinking they're a playoff team. Most teams like that will add a reliever either on the margins or, you know, as a setup guy in free agency, just to sure up that bullpen. But the bullpen was the best part of this Orioles team this year. And Mike Elias built it solely from rookies and waiver claims. So if he thinks he can do that again, while not, you know, putting any money towards his bullpen and still having it be a what was a top five bullpen for pretty much the entire year and ended up being a top 10 bullpen. I think he's going to continue to do that. But if he were to branch out and maybe sign, you know, one veteran reliever to a free agent deal, 
I don't think he's going after the big name closers. You know, Kenley Jansen, Craig Kimbrell, those guys are free agents this year. They're not coming to the O's. But maybe a middle relief type who would be cheap and just come in and kind of secure the bullpen, get a veteran in there and help the O's. I came up with four names. Michael Fulmer was one guy I mentioned. He pitched with Detroit this year, then was traded to the Twins. 3-3-9 ERA, 29 years old. Nothing jumps off the page, but he just gets people out. He'd probably be a cheap deal that would help the bullpen. Matt Strom, who we've seen a lot, a left-hander who's been in the Red Sox bullpen. 3-8-3 ERA, a 27% strikeout rate. Really gets lefties out well. Um, has some good stuff. He can actually face both sides of the plate. He's definitely a useful reliever still. I think he'd be cheap to bring in. Chris Martin is a guy I have loved, and I've wanted the O's to bring in for a couple years now. He was traded to the Dodgers at the deadline this year. I mean, Chris Martin is just fun to watch. A 3.05 ERA. He doesn't walk anybody. The league average walk percentage is 8%. He's walking 2.2% of batters. He just throws strikes to everyone. And not only does he not walk guys, but he's been an elite strikeout pitcher. 32.9% K rate. That's well over league average with a 2% walk rate is crazy numbers. I would love to have Chris Martin in this bullpen. He's not a closer. He's not even really a setup guy. He's just one of the best middle relievers in baseball. And I think he could really help the O's. And then the last guy is Seth Lugo. We've seen, you know, Buck Showalter use him out of the Mets bullpen. Just a solid piece, veteran piece, 3.60 ERA, about 25% strikeout rate, 6% walk rate. You know, that's better than average in, in both of those spots and, and would just be a solid middle relief piece. Again, I think if the O's did add a piece in the bullpen, it would be kind of a middle reliever. But That'll do it for today's Mailbag Monday episode of the podcast. Now, if you asked a question on Twitter and you did not hear it answered, don't worry. I was uh, very pleased to get a whole lot of questions on our Locked on Orioles Twitter page. And what that means is we're doing another Mailbag episode tomorrow. That's right. We'll be back answering nine more questions on a Mailbag Tuesday episode of the podcast tomorrow. So if your question was not answered, well... It's most likely going to be answered on tomorrow's pod. So make sure to stick around for that one. But one more thing before I get going here on the pod, if you are watching on the Locked On Orioles YouTube page, you can check this one out. I want to shout out to a listener, Chris, uh, who sent us this t-shirt that I'm going to plug because it is definitely a cool one. It is the Great Eights t-shirt. You can get it on Route 1 Apparel if you're looking for it. I'll post a picture of it on the at Locked on Orioles Twitter page for those listening on audio so you can see it. But it's got the Maryland flag eight here in the front and then the back, really the best part here. So you can see it on the YouTube page, the great eights of Baltimore, Lamar Jackson, Alex Ovechkin, and Cal Ripken Jr. on the back. Great t-shirt that I'll be wearing, but make sure to go get one at RouteOneApparel.com. Thank you to Chris for sending one of these over our way. Hey, if you got merch and you uh, you want it to display it on the podcast, send it to me and I'll let the people know, but definitely a cool t-shirt here to, uh, hey, if you support DC and Baltimore sports like I do, I'm an O's and Ravens fan, but also cheer for the Caps and the Wizards. Here's your t-shirt right here. But that'll do it for today's episode. Again, we'll be back tomorrow with a Mailbag Tuesday episode of the podcast, answering more of your Orioles questions. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.